Thank you very much uh, for attending. Before we uh, start with the meeting, I've asked Mr. Blake to open it up with a prayer. Mr. Blake. Thank you, Lord, for this day. May many more come. We thank you for all the blessings you have bestowed upon us. We ask that you watch over our constituents wherever they may be. We ask all this in your holy and precious name, Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, so we have one, agen uh, one agenda item is Bill 16. Um, so welcome to the meeting on the Standing Committee of Social Development. Uh, I'll start with Mr. B Mr. Blake to introduce himself. And then Good afternoon, Frederick Blake, MLA for Mackenzie Delta. Um, Michael Nadley, MLA for Ditchell. Kevin O'Reilly, Frame Lake. RJ Simpson, MLA Haver North. Uh, uh, to my left is our law clerk, uh, Shirley McPherson, uh, Legislative Assembly Analyst, uh, Megan Welsh. Uh, our clerk, uh, Doug Charity. I'm also the chairperson for social development, and I, I'm from the handy welcome, everybody. Uh, today, this committee is holding a public hearing on Bill 16, an act to amend the Education Act. The bill is currently under the committee's review. Next week, we'll also be traveling to Hay River and Anubik to conduct additional public hearings. If you'd like to share your views with the committee today, please let the clerk know. He'll be sure to get you on the list. We also accept written submissions until Thursday, April 13th. Both junior kindergarten and classroom instructional hours have been widely discussed. We know these issues matter greatly to our constituents as they do to us as members, and we know that the bill the Department of Education, Culture, and Employment has put forward may not speak to all your questions and concerns today. Our committee worked on these issues extensively well beyond the scope of what we can do in review this one bill. To open that work to open that work up to the public and to be transparent as possible, we have released our letters to, to the minister that pertain to these issues as well as his replies. You can find these documents on the Legislative Assembly website under news releases. We have some hard copies and they are available here at the back of the uh, side table. As well, copies of Bill 16 are currently available on the side table. We'll now hear from the Minister. After we have initial exchange with Minister Moses, we'll move into presentations from witnesses. Minister Moses, please introduce your staff for the record and proceed with any open comments you may have on Bill 16. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, good afternoon to committee members. I'm pleased to be here today to introduce Bill 16, an act to amend the Education Act. This amendment seeks to change the age of entitlement to access kindergarten programs from five years of age to four years of age, as well as to reduce the minimum hours of instruction required for grades 1 through 12 to 945 hours. With me this afternoon is my Deputy Minister, Ms. Sylvia Hayner, uh, Assistant Deputy Minister of Corporate Services, Mr. Olin Lovely, uh, Assistant Deputy Minister of Education and Culture, Ms. M uh, Rita Mueller, Mr. Sam Shannon, Director of Policy, Legislation and Communication, uh, Ms. Julia Mott, Senior Advisor to, to the Deputy Minister, uh, Ms. Myla Page, my Ministerial Special Advisor, and Mr. Mike Reddy uh, from the Department of Justice. Mr. Chair, two key priorities of the 18th Legislative Assembly are to support quality early childhood development and to improve the educational outcomes of our northern residents. The amendments proposed in Bill 16 will go a long way towards achieving this goal. As Minister of Education, Culture and Employment, I am tasked with the responsibility of leading the changes necessary to achieve these two priorities. Changing the status quo is not easy. It requires the assistance of many experts and partners. It requires us to engage with critics to ensure we have considered all points of view and possible outcomes. And we do, and we have done this extensively. I'm sure we all recognize we simply cannot continue doing the same things over and over and expect different results. We must try new evidence-based approaches in order to see improvements. We need to innovate. Fundamentally, skill development starts at an early age. That is why this government continues to make significant investments in the development and implementation of three 10-year frameworks and associated action plans. These plans collectively provide a comprehensive research-based approach 
to how we will make the changes necessary to see improvements in the quality of life for the people we serve as mandated by this assembly. The Early Childhood Development Framework and Action Plan right from the start was created in partnership with the Department of Health and Social Services. It focuses on improving services targeted for young children and their families and includes a commitment to provide free quality early learning programming for four-year-olds. The K-12 Education Renewal and Innovation Framework and Action Plan, Directions for Change, lays out a vision for Northern learners to receive a quality education in order to live fulfilled lives as capable people and contribute to strong, healthy communities. The Skills for Success Framework and Action Plan seeks to close both education and employment gaps for Northerners with made in the NWT solutions. All three of these frameworks and action plans build on each other. They will help to bring about the change necessary to improve student transitions and the quality of education and will create pathways for our Northern learners to advanced education and careers that align with NWT labor market demands and opportunities. Mr. Chair, education does not look the way it did when you and I went to school. Three years ago, we began a journey of education renewal. We engaged many stakeholders, teachers, parents, students, the business community, and Aboriginal governments to name a few. We consulted with experts working on the cutting edge of educational theory and practice. We asked elders to advise us on traditional ways of learning that remain relevant today. We looked across the world for the newest and best research coming out of countries such as Finland, the UK, and of course, Canada. This work led us to the inevitable conclusion that the way schools are set up and the way teachers teach must be revisited and reflective of many different ways students learn. We learned about self-regulation and brought it into the schools with very promising results. E-learning piloted in the Beaufort Delta brought students some wonderful successes to the point that other regions are keen to introduce it. The Dega School in Fort Providence told us they wanted to change the school year to accommodate community cultural activities and family events. They made this change and improved both attendance and student engagement and had time to connect students to their cultural practices in a much more meaningful way. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, I remind members of some of our achievements because the journey we are currently a part of is made up of many steps. Our research tells us that bringing junior kindergarten to all our communities is the next step in re-energizing the school system to make it more responsive to student learning and education success. Mr. Chair, I want to publicly state that I believe the territory-wide implementation of junior kindergarten and the opportunity to build adequate time during the school year for teachers to complete their professional duties and strengthen the quality of instructional practices will be game changers. I am confident these initiatives will over time lead to improved outcomes in our education system. This assembly has recognized early childhood development is critical to a child's future success and there's a direct link between the quality of early education and care and positive early childhood development. Data from the Early Development Instrument, or EDI, has shown us that many, that many NWT children are vulnerable in one or more critical development areas, reflecting the need for investment. In fact, EDI data has shown that 38% of five-year-old children in the NWT are vulnerable in one area of their development, as compared to 20% in the rest of Canada, in the small communities. As many as 53% of five-year-olds are vulnerable in one area. Mr. Chair, junior kindergarten for four-year-old children is a free play-based developmentally appropriate program. It will provide families in the NWT communities, regardless of their income or geographic location, the economic benefit of saving up to $12,000 a year in childcare fees while providing their child with a high quality early learning program. This government has committed to funding JK at a guaranteed 12 to, fund, 12 to 1 student teacher ratio. We have also committed to providing funding to help schools purchase appropriate play based equipment and resources for all JK classrooms and make any infrastructure changes to JK classrooms that may be required. 
district education authorities will have the option to decide whether to offer JK as a half day program or a full day program. This will allow them the opportunity to partner and collaborate with existing early childhood programs. DEAs will also have the option of having JK taught by either a teacher holding a Bachelor of Education degree or by an educator who has a minimum of a two-year diploma in early childhood development from an accredited post-secondary program. Assistance is available for anyone who wishes to pursue these credentials. The government has also provided significant increases to the early childhood program operating subsidies that licensed early childhood programs receive. This helps operators mitigate any impact of having fewer four-year-old children in their programs. Mr. Chair, I've heard members express concerns about how JK children with special needs will be supported. All schools in the NWT follow the Ministerial Directive on Inclusive Schooling, which was updated last year. It is focused on ensuring success for all students through collaborative support systems that enable teachers to best meet diverse needs in their classrooms. Through the NWT's inclusive schooling model, each school's school-based support team can include a variety of members. Teams can include such members as principals, program support teachers, classroom teachers, parents, students where appropriate, and regional inclusive school coordinator and the superintendent. As well, there may be support from other related service providers and professionals from other departments, such as the Department of Health and Social Services. The school-based support team works together to problem solve and develop strategies to support classroom teachers in meeting students' needs and to reduce barriers to learning. As with all students, children are exceptionalities entering JK with exceptionalities entering JK will have access to the existing school supports. Mr. Chair, another step on the journey to education renewal is to provide teachers with the time they need to plan and develop their own learning. This government knows that in order to improve our students' academic results, we not only need JK offered in every community, we also need our teachers to have time during the regular work week and school year to develop their skills and properly plan, implement, and assess their students' learning. We also know that teachers must have time to learn new ways of teaching required to help their students be highly engaged in their learning and successful in their studies. In order to provide teachers with the time they need during their workday, a reduction in classroom time is required. Research shows us that across Canada, less classroom hours have not negatively impacted student success. In fact, with the right planning and proper student support, the opposite is true. In order to improve student outcomes, we must ensure educators have access to the experiences, resources, training, and professional development to improve their workload and wellness situations so that they can focus on excellence in teaching. That is what the Strengthening Teachers Instructional Practices Initiative, or STEP, is all about. Teacher workload and wellness concerns have been identified as an issue by all workload studies conducted across Canada. In Canada, instructional hours, in Canada, instructional hours vary somewhat by province but teachers typically report working 50 to 55 hours per week. One of the common concerns is the amount of time teachers spend working outside of the instructional day, which is negatively impacting the work-life balance. This is true in the NWT as well. Another common concern is the inadequate amount of preparation allocated within the school day. Most Canadian jurisdictions allot a specified amount of preparation time for teachers during the school day. This varies considerably from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. In the NWT, there is no guaranteed minimum prep time for teachers. In the ECE teacher time and workload study, participating teachers reported work in over 17 hours per week outside of the regular teacher instructional days of 8 to 4, Monday to Friday. The teachers in the study reported that most of this time was spent on planning, assessing, and reporting. The three-year STEP initiative is anticipated to address many of the concerns around instructional time and helping greater consistency in teacher preparation time across NWT schools. Additionally, this initiative focuses on embedding structured time for collaborative professional learning. A significant international report by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, amongst others, 
concluded that ongoing plan time professional collaboration and learning is associated with higher job satisfaction and teacher effectiveness. This initiative aims to make improvements in these areas by focusing on strengthening teacher practice through group learning. Mr. Chair, we have heard concerns that the Alberta high school curriculum, which is taught in NWT schools, requires 1,000 hours of instructional time to properly teach, and that by lessening this time, there will be negative impact on NWT teachers' ability to fully teach these high school courses. As Alberta goes through their own K-12 education renewal process, it is emerging that this is not the case. Over two-thirds of Alberta high schools are participating in their own province-wide initiative that focuses on redesigning high school courses and delivery in a more flexible way, which is not tied to the 1,000 hours of instruction. In the NWT, a joint committee made up of representatives from ECE, the NWT Superintendents Association, and the Northwest Territories Teachers Association will review every proposal submitted by NWT schools for their participation in this initiative beginning in the 2017-18 school year. The committee's approval is required before any change can be made to a school calendar. This joint committee is also developing an evaluation plan to identify appropriate ways to measure the success of this initiative. This planning process includes defining what success for this three-year initiative will look like, taking into consideration the multitude of variables that could be considered. It will recognize that any significant change will take time, and the actual evaluation itself will likely evolve as schools try new approaches. The committee recognizes that each school may have different number of redirected instructional hours and a range of ways that, is redirected time, that this redirected time will be used. However, all redirected time in every school proposal must fall within guidelines provided and be divided between the categories of individual and collaborative planning, learning, assessment, reporting, and training. Similar to Alberta's experience with their high school redesign project, we would not expect evaluation tools to look for immediate changes in graduation rates or some equivalent measure, though over the length of the 10-year education removal framework, these might legitimately be used. The draft evaluation plan will be completed by the end of the 2016-17 school year, and I will share, share it with committee at that time. Mr. Chair, the purpose of Bill 16 and the goal of these two major initiatives are to improve the NWT education system for all learners so that they can meet the challenges of today and into the future and be successful in whatever they choose to do. I believe in years to come, we will look back at this moment in time and to these two strategic initiatives and see them as a vital step on the road to success for our young children, our youth, and our territory. With that, Mr. Chair, uh, I conclude my opening remarks and uh, look forward to answering any questions that members may have on Bill 16. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Moses. Uh, before we move forward, I, I forgot to inform uh, everybody here present that uh, Ms. Green, uh, who is a member of this committee, was unable to attend due to uh, duty, uh, duty travel. Um, as well, uh, Minister Lou Siebert is uh, in attendance, uh, taking in uh, the hearing, just so that, we, for the record, so we know everybody's here. At this point in time, I open the floor to any questions for the Minister, Minister Moses. Or, Mr. Simpson. Uh, thank you. Uh, the legislation... Uh, contemplates a change of the, uh, the age that children will be allowed in school from uh, five to four. Now, uh, junior kindergarten has already been running without this change, and it can, my understanding is it's a program of ECE. It, it can continue to run. So what is the point of uh, enshrining this in legislation? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Minister Moses. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, initially, when we started the education renewal process of uh, changing up how we, we teach our uh, students and looking at early childhood development, uh, the junior kindergarten was a piloted program. 
And uh, now that uh, we've seen some of the success in the community, we do have to uh, make it legislation to allow for the four-year-olds into the uh, JK to 12 system. Thank you. Thank Mr. you. Chair. Mr. Moses, Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm looking for uh, the technical specific reason why it has to be changed because there are four-year-olds in the school system in the pilot programs at junior kindergarten. I haven't found anywhere in the legislation that says pilot programs can only go on three years, that the EC has, can only run uh, programs for three years and then legislative changes need to be made. So uh, can someone give me a technical answer why this, this change has to be made? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Minister Moses. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, previous when the program is a piloted project, uh, schools had the option of providing junior kindergarten in the program as Minister of Education, College and Employment, and I've said it uh, many times that uh, I can't pick and choose where we run certain programs in, the, uh, in uh, the territory. We need to make this legislated so that all schools have the opportunity to uh, run junior kindergarten program in their schools. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Moses. Mr. O'Reilly. <clears throat> Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Yeah, in the uh, Minister's opening remarks on the uh, top of page 8 there, he talks about how the um, change in instructional hours is uh, uh, really a three-year initiative. Um, and I'm just wondering if he can confirm that that three-year initiative is, is it's tied to the collective agreement in the uh, MOU that was negotiated with the Teachers Association. Is that correct? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Minister Moses. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, when the uh, MOU was, was brought forward in the collective agreements, uh, we looked at uh, how we can uh, evaluate the program, look at the instructional hours, and we're piloting in the three-year program. Uh, YCS and YK1 are also looking at it during their, uh, their bargaining agreements, so we wanted to pilot it and evaluate year after year to see how it's working out and uh, uh, if there's any changes that we need to make, how we can improve it as we go from year to year. Thank you, Minister Moses. Mr. Wright. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So I, I don't think I really got an answer, though. This, um, so it's described here as a three-year initiative. Um, can the minister then tell me when it ends and when the collective agreement and the MOU end and whether that's uh, happening at the same time? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Minister Moses. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, I believe it is a three-year agreement uh, moving forward with the, uh, the, the uh, step at the end the, uh, the MOU. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Moses. Mr. Simpson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So you're the, the Minister mentioned you can't pick and choose where junior kindergarten is rolled out. And uh, it, it seems to me that the department wants to roll it out. That's why it's going to be rolled out. There's no, there's no reason to enshrine this in legislation other than the, the department wants to do that. And if that's what the answer is, that's fine. I'd just like a straightforward answer when it comes to that. Um, are there... Are there other concerns about why this has to be rolled out everywhere? Are there human rights issues if you don't offer this program in every community? Uh, or is it just because the department wants to roll it out everywhere? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. <clears throat> Minister Moses. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. As I mentioned, uh, when we do pilot projects, we do reach out to the schools and uh, try to get uh, schools that want to try to pilot uh, to see the success and efficiencies of it. Uh, we have seen success in junior kindergarten, as we have made presentations to standing committee before. As a minister, I can't uh, leave it as an option for schools to run junior kindergarten. We want to provide equal education to families, to four-year-olds, and by putting it in legislation, we're providing that, uh, providing it so that uh, uh, all schools will uh, run junior kindergarten, and it's still optional for, for parents and families to uh, whether or not they want to put their child in, in junior kindergarten. Thank you. Mr. Moses. Mr. Simpson. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Um, so enshrining this in legislation means that uh, it will become mandatory for all school districts to, uh, to offer junior kindergarten. Uh, so are, I was wondering, uh, are there benefits, additional benefits like changing the age from five to four basically adding another grade in legislation, does that affect our territorial formula financing? If we go to the feds and say, now we have another grade, 
and so we need more money to administer that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Simpson. And Mr. Moses. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I wouldn't say it affects our federal financing, but territorially we would be uh, uh, giving more funding to the education authorities based on the enrollment. So junior kindergarten, when uh, students go into the junior kindergarten program, uh, they will get more money based on enrollments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Moses. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I just want to go back to the change in instructional hours if I can. Uh, the um, minister's opening statement talks about how there's going to be a committee set up uh, for representatives of ECE, the uh, Superintendents Association and the Teachers Association, and that that committee is going to review any changes in uh, school calendar and presumably the um, the, they're also going to develop this evaluation framework and so on. Can the minister explain uh, or tell us uh, how many uh, district education authorities have actually developed uh, a, a, or, or a plan for these changes? And how many have actually been accepted by this uh, committee? And, and indeed, is the committee actually established and working? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Minister Moses. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and I can inform the member and committee here that we're expecting all 49 schools in NLT to submit a proposal. Uh, I believe right now about half of them have been uh, looked at it and approved, and uh, moving forward, we're hoping to uh, uh, review the rest of the uh, proposals that the schools are, uh, well, submitting their proposals here. But uh, the Joint Committee is up and, and running currently, yes, and they're working on that evaluation plan which I mentioned in my opening comments, uh, will be ready for the end of this uh, uh, school year. And once that's done, I will come back and I'll share that with committee as well. Thank you. Mr. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Appreciate the, the answer from the minister. Can the minister uh, explain uh, a little bit more about what the relationship is between the evaluation framework for this uh, pilot uh, as I understand it, for the change in instructional hours and the uh, accountability framework that's being developed by the department, uh, an overall accountability framework for uh, education funding and so on. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Mr. O'Reilly, Minister Moses. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And with anything that we do in the education system as this accountability framework is being developed, is going to look at the whole system, the whole JK to 12 system, and uh, look at how we are spending our dollars within our authority. So it's going to work uh, hand in hand, obviously. Thank you, Minister Moses. Mr. Simpson. Uh, thank you. Uh, staying with this joint committee, it's uh, made up of, with members of ECE, the NWT Superintendents Association, and the NWTTA. Uh, it's my understanding that most of the superintendents are now part of the GNWT, and so uh, I, I guess that's just their ECE. So what is the makeup of this? How many ECE employees and how many NWT TA representatives are on this board? What's the, what's the makeup? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Ms. Mueller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so from the NWTTA, uh, the president and two staff as executive director and assistant um, director from the superintendents, uh, they chose uh, two um, committee members um, to represent them and to bring back to the whole, to all eight of them um, as needed information or to include them as needed. And from ECE, myself, as well as uh, three directors. Mr. Simpson. Thank you. And are the superintendents uh, GNWT employees that are on this board? Thank you, Mr. All right, we're, uh, part of the public service, I should say. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Ms. Mueller. Yes, they are. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can we oh, sorry. You? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, they are. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to go back to. Uh, uh, well, I want to preface the account. Uh, my my statement here. Look, I support teachers. I think they work uh, more hours than they ever probably should um, and uh, are required to and so on. But um, this, uh, the change in instructional hours has been proposed as a, a pilot project. And in the minister's statement, he talks about this being a three-year initiative. So why are we making these changes to the legislation that would permanently change instructional hours? Why is, are the changes not put forward in a, in a way that uh, allow for adjustment or an eva the evaluation to be done and uh, uh, reviewed uh, 
uh, after the uh, three-year period. Why are the changes being put forward as a permanent change? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Minister Moses. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, currently, the uh, minimal annual instructional hours are set out in the Education Act. Uh, for us to go move ahead in this pilot and, and allow this to happen, we do need to change uh, the current minimums, which is, I believe, uh, 1,045 hours from the uh, grade 7 to 12, and we need to have that reflective of uh, uh, what we can provide to our schools so they can participate in the program. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, maybe I wasn't as clear as I uh, could or should have been, but uh, would it not be possible to draft the, the, the change in instructional hours in a way that would uh, uh, allow for um, uh, the – or uh, to make it clear that this is uh, being done as a pilot project and that it is going to be reviewed after three years? Could we not draft the legislation in a manner that would do that rather than permanently change uh, the instructional hours so that if something is, does, it doesn't work out in terms of the evaluation, it's going to require another legislative change? So can't we uh, build in some greater flexibility with the, uh, the, legislative, uh, with the legislation and allow for the, the instructional hours to be reviewed at the end of the pilot project? Uh, and, and build that into the, the legislation itself. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Minister Moses. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, currently at this time, uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, for all schools to participate uh, in this project, and then we also shared a graph uh, chart with the committee there uh, with the instructional hours that are currently happening within some of our schools. This will allow the schools to uh, be have more flexibility in how they uh, manage their instructional hours. Uh, maybe a little bit more detail, I'll ask uh, my Deputy Minister uh, for a little bit more detail. Thank you, Minister Moses. Ms. Hainer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, when you look at, at the minimum hours um, that are required un under the Act, there's a great deal of flexibility for grades one to six, given the, the numbers of, of maximum or the minimum outlined in legislation there, in terms of what's achievable with the uh, with the pilots that we wish to undertake. Um, there's less flexibility uh, for us given the minimums outlined for grades seven to twelve, and that's the area of concern that we have. We want. Um, to ensure that the same opportunity is available to teachers um, and schools and, and students uh, and, and communities who are participating and, and supporting these changes um, for all grade levels, um, rather than having it vary between um, the elementary and, and the higher grades. So that's kind of where our issue arises right now. Thank you, Ms. Hainer. Mr. Simpson. Uh, thank you. Uh, my first question, well, I'll, I'll stick with the instructional hours. Uh, the department sort of usurped the authority of this committee by entering into an MOU that required legislative change, which requires votes from, uh, from this House as well as approval of, uh, uh, you know, input from this committee as to a bill. It's really uh, not the way this government is supposed to work. It's not the way that uh, democracy is supposed to work. And so, uh, what is uh, the consequences? Has the, has the department thought about what happens if uh, this change to the instructional hours uh, doesn't make it into legislation? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Minister Moses. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is the process right now where we come and present before a committee on the bill. Uh, then you go out and take it out on the road to get uh, public input. Um, this is something that uh, the teachers wanted. Uh, when the uh, MOU was developed and we wanted to respect their wellness and their workload and uh, the research that has also been shown across Canada. We looked at jurisdictions, uh, I believe six provinces that uh, decreased their time, seeing significant, some, some improvements and the research that we did uh, go, and, go out and look at did show uh, some good improvements in the decreased time. And I'll actually go over to the uh, Deputy Minister for a little bit more detail. Thank you, Minister Moses. Ms. Hainer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the bargaining team, both on, on the part of the Teachers Association and the GWT, is very cognizant of where the lines are in terms of, of how far it can go 
um, in entering into agreements um, at the bargaining table. And when you take a very, uh, when you take a look at the MOU that was entered into, there is nothing in there that binds the GNWT uh, to make legislative change. We have come forward here uh, today and, and earlier through the process, um, having entered into that MOU and recognizing that, that we had something that we want to do jointly with the Teachers Association to improve the education system and recognizing that the legislation itself creates um, some barriers or some inequity in terms of how we can roll out that pilot to all grades, um, uh, for all grades uh, in the school system. Um, it is not the intention to compel any legislators, yourselves, to, to make the legislative change. We are making the case here for change and we are hopeful that you would support it. But the pilots can proceed without making legislative change. Um, what will happen is that those pilots will differ. They will look different for the elementary grades versus um, the more senior grades because of, of the hour uh, minimums outlined in the current legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Hainer. Mr. Simpson. Yeah, I'm aware there's nothing that binds the GNWT, but uh, made an agreement and uh, the conclusion of that agreement uh, you know, according to reports that we saw in the news, it was sort of uh, th this hundred hours was was part of it. I mean, uh, who, it, would an agreement have been reached without this hundred hours? And so, what's the contingency if this bill fails? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Minister Moses. Yeah, just for clarification, it was up to a hundred hours. So all schools are submitting different uh, instructional hours. Uh, should the bill not pass, as, as you heard from my DM, then all our teachers that are teaching at the, uh, the high school level would uh, have a harder time in terms of uh, what's already outlined in the current Education Act, which is 1,045 hours. And uh, by putting that into legislation, we allow them the flexibility to do the things that I had mentioned in my uh, opening comments, planning, assessing, and being professional development for themselves as well. Thank you, Mr. Moses. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, a couple of questions along the same lines that I've been pursuing here. First off, I guess I, I want to make sure that the uh, accountability framework that's being developed, um, that, th that that will include um, identification of uh, particular in, uh, specific indicators around uh, teacher wellness. That the, the, we're not just going to leave this to the development of the uh, the evaluation framework for this three-year pilot, but the accountability framework itself will identify uh, uh, indicators of teacher wellness, and that that will be uh, become part of how we uh, uh, evaluate uh, the overall system. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Minister Moses. Ah, uh, uh, yes, that's correct, and. Uh, we have worked on that accountability framework. We can share it with committee if committee wants to, to take a look at it. But we can also look at other things in terms of uh, teacher wellness through surveys, uh, number of sick days that uh, some of our teachers might be, be having, uh, even the professional development that our teachers sign up and, and apply for. So there's a few uh, variables that we can, can look at when we're assessing the teacher wellness. Thank you, Minister Moses. Mr. Riley. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair, and I'd very much uh, be interested in seeing the, the work that we get that uh, from the minister. Uh, and I, I've been on record as supporting uh, teacher wellness as part of our uh, way of evaluating uh, the, the overall education system and supporting teachers. So th that would be good work. Um, I want to turn back, though, to the question I asked previously about the, uh, the three-year uh, pilot project. Is there not a way in which the legislation can be drafted so that at the end of the, the, eva the evaluation period, the uh, instructional hours are evaluated again um, and uh, changed one way or another uh, in light of the evaluation. Is there not a way to draft the legislation to provide for uh, review at the end of the uh, 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 pilot projects uh, so that we're not making a permanent change in instructional hours, as is the case now with the way the legislation's been drafted? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. O'Reilly. Minister Moses. Yep, thank you. And uh, as, as I mentioned, um, under the Education Act and the amount of instructional hours that we have for the uh, 7 and the 12, the high school, uh, we need that change so we, we allow our 
staff that are in those jobs to have that flexibility to participate. Um, but I will go to our, our drafter, um, Mr. Reddy, for a little bit more detail on, on that specific question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Moses. Mr. Reddy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm going to give a, a technical answer to the question, of course. Uh, right now, obviously, the instructional hours are, are prescribed by law. They're in law. They're, they're in the Act, not regulation. I would suggest that even if the Act were amended to say that the instructional hours were for, to be for a period of three years, at which time further evaluation is, is to be conducted, uh, even at that point in time, it would require another subsequent amendment if uh, it's the intention of the Legislative Assembly of the Northwest Territories to have those instructional hours within the Act itself. So either way, there would be, need to be another amendment to the Act in order uh, for that to happen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Reddy. Mr. Simpson. Uh, thank you. So th the Minister stated that if this, uh, the clause related to the instructional hours fails, the teachers would just uh, take, the, take the hit, basically. And so what's happened is that you pit this committee against teachers. Uh, you sort of promised them something, and then we have to deliver on the department's promise. And uh, I'm in favor of it. I'm in favor of this clause. I just don't believe this is uh, the, the way the legislation sh should be created. And uh, in the future, I hope that uh, the department uh, learns from this. So uh, I'll move on to another line of questioning. Uh, there's ongoing concerns about Aboriginal Head Start. I'm just getting questions about this from uh, constituents. And I believe that it's, uh, it's, it's put on by multi-year funding agreements between the Government of Canada and the uh, GNWT. I believe Aboriginal Head Start. No, it's a. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, is there JWT funding associated with Aboriginal Head Start? I'll ask. How about that? Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Minister Moses. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And, uh, Aboriginal Head Start gets most of their funding from the federal government. We do top them up and give them uh, extra funding, uh, and it did increase this past fiscal year to all the, all the Aboriginal Head Start groups. Thank you, Minister Moses. Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And will that uh, GNWT support continue indefinitely despite uh, the implementation of junior kindergarten? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Minister Moses. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And yes, we will continue to uh, fund Aboriginal Head Start. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Moses. Any other questions for the Minister? Okay, I just have a couple. Um, in regards to uh, in the House and in previously, we've heard that after a year that the department could potentially turn it back. So has the department looked at this? This is what we heard in the House, is that, um, that at some point in time it said that uh, if it didn't work it, after a year that it wouldn't be implemented. So is the department looking at it? Is it going to implement this, these changes over a year or is this going to be a three-year pro pro project and then it's going to be evaluated that time? Thank you, Minister Moses. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. We're committed to uh, the three-year uh, pilot. Uh, as I mentioned, we did create an evaluation, uh, and we're going to be uh, evaluating the program on a yearly basis uh, with the steering committee looking at uh, each school and uh, moving forward in case there's any changes that we do need to make and make any improvements, but uh, we are committed to the three years. Thank you. Minister Moses, I appreciate that clarification. Just in regards to uh, looking at your uh, opening remarks on that, um, you've said that, you know, the 10-year uh, education renewal framework so is, is the challenge, right? So we're looking at a three-year pilot project, but we're not really going to see res results. So realistically, should this pilot project not be longer than the three years? Should it should be for 10 years? So we're actually seeing results. So we can see it's concrete that we're actually making good decisions or we need to move on. Thank you, Minister Moses. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. The, uh, the SNP pilot uh, project is one of many, as I mentioned in my opening comments with education renewal. I know we did have a uh, scheduled uh, presentation to committee uh, previously where we wanted to outline all the programs that we're doing with education renewal. There's a lot of really good work going on 
out in our in our schools in the regions in the communities and we wanted to update members on that three years we feel that we can see successes see improvements that would help us make concrete decisions on moving forward on the long term and that's where we're doing the three-year pilot and each year evaluate it and at the end of the project move forward and decide thank you mr. chair thank you mr. Moses I appreciate your answer to my last question on step is that after three years is there going to be a kind of a void is it going to be are you going to be reviewing year by year big year by year three we're going to be able to come up with a plan for the next three years or the next seven years is that the process or because I've seen plans within the government it's project pilot project and after three years it's done and there's a bit of a void so is this going to be a planned process that after three years we're still good we're not going to see a slip in what we're trying to do thank you minister Moses thank you mr. chair and we're committed through our education renewal the 10-year project I believe in commitment number three and commitment number six that speaks to improving teacher and practices enhancing teacher wellness that's in our 10-year framework so this is one of the pilots I'm going to be looking at to ensure that we can meet those needs within our education renewal framework moving forward so after three years we will evaluate it and look at how the pilots gone and move forward as we said we're also looking at research across Canada and seeing how things are being implemented and as I mentioned in my my opening comments as well that schools in Alberta have been making those changes already thank you mr. chair thank you mr. Moses mr. Riley thanks mr. chair um just wanted to pursue one other matter with the changes in instructional hours and one of the concerns I've heard is that parents and I'll just use an example say like yellow knife I've heard some concerns from parents to say that they want to see the the change in instructional hours coordinated across the school systems so that if they have to drop kids off for you know I don't know kindergarten or grade five and then they got to drop off kids for high school that somehow that's going to be coordinated in some way and that that the boards and yellow knife might be encouraged to try to come up with a common approach so that they can count on getting their kids dropped off at the right time or getting their kids on buses and so on and coordinating the whole bus busing of students and so on what sort of parameters are is that joint committee using in terms of evaluating the proposals that are put forward and his coordination of the start times and so on within a community is that one of the considerations and you know we can't tell the school boards what to do but is that something that the the joint committees looking at thanks mr. chair mr. minister Moses thank thank you mr. chair and we don't put the parameters on the the schools themselves or the education boards very unique here in yellow knife that we do have three education bodies that need to work together and and I can see where the members coming from hearing concerns here and here in yellow knife it's up to the schools to to come up with the their their proposals and the joint joint committee reviews it obviously they want to do what's best for not only the student but the families as well welcome when they're participating in this pilot maybe for a little bit more detail since I miss Mueller does sit on that joint committee she can give a little bit more information on that thank you mr. chair thank you mr. miss Mueller thank you mr. chair so the joint committee to answer the members question we haven't put parameters on when school starts or ends that's up to each education authority but I can tell you that all three yellow knife education authorities are really committed to what's doing what's best for their families that they serve and they also understand that many families in yellow knife have some children in one authority and other children in another authority and they're very aware of that and I think that they make every every possible effort to always coordinate not just because of these upcoming this opportunity to do things differently but every year they sit down multiple times during the year to try to coordinate major sporting events or major professional development opportunities where they can share resources and facilities and it's my experience that they continue to do that 
Thank you. Mr. Riley. Uh, thanks. Uh, I appreciate the uh, response from the department. I might have similar questions for any representatives of the <laughs> education authorities that, that do come forward, but uh, appreciate the answers from the, the department. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Have more comment. Uh, Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have to excuse myself. I have another event to attend, but I want to thank the uh, department for, for coming here, and I know that uh, the minister is working hard and, uh, you know, trying to do what he can to uh, improve the educational outcomes of all uh, residents, and uh, it's my job to grill him on that. So I appreciate him sitting here and taking it. Thank you. More of a comment, minister. Any other comments, questions? I just have one last one. Um, in your on your opening comments, you talk about guaranteed 12 to 1. That's across the territories. That's not specifically each community, correct, Minister Moses? When you yeah. talk about the average. Yes, that's correct. Okay. So I guess my last question then is, so some schools may have more students in there than 12 to 1, then say maybe Yellowknife may have 19 to 1, or Fort Simpson may have. 16 to 1 because of the different smaller communities out there. Thank you, Minister Moses. Uh, yes, that's correct. And uh, on the other side of that, they might even have, have less. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Minister Moses. I appreciate uh, the, the time. Um, uh, that would appear to conclude the initial exchange between Minister Moses and his team. I'd like to thank everybody for showing up and being present here. Uh, we'll excuse them from the witness table and note that they are welcome to observe our remaining deliberations from the gallery, sorry, uh, should they be able to stay on. Uh, we have some individuals that pre-registered to come forward and shared their thoughts on this bill. We will call them to come forward before opening things up to everyone else that may wish to provide their input. Uh, Minister Moses, should you have any final comments before you wish to leave? Uh, no, I just uh, want to state that um, we do have a big job ahead of us within the whole education system. This is just uh, uh, some of the stepping blocks that we need to, to look at and address and support not only our teachers but our families and need what's best for the, uh, the child. Uh, look forward to hearing the comments and feedback that the community gets from when they're on the road. And, I uh, appreciate the, uh, the comments uh, as well as the questions over the course of this uh, past year in trying to get this uh, done right. And uh, obviously we're all doing this for the, uh, in the best interest of our residents in the north. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Moses. And I thank again, thank you, you and your staff for appearing before committee. Um, at this point in time, we'll have a brief break and then... Thank you. Um, welcome back from our brief uh, break here. Uh, can you please state your name and any affiliation you may have with an organization or group and proceed with your comments, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Oh. Chair. Sorry, um, Mr. Oliver, yes, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Fraser Oliver and I'm the president of the Northwest Territories Teachers Association. And this is uh, Adrian Amaro, who is the NWT Executive Director. Um, I think we were uh, mentioned that we are both on the STIP committee, so you put a name, put a name with a face there. 
And uh, we're here today to speak to you on the proposed changes to Bill 16 and to let you know uh, the positive impact that STIP has had on our schools this year and, uh, and what schools are planning to do next year. Uh, we'd like to encourage you to support the changes to Bill 16 that would include amending the ages from five to four years old and amending the instructional hours to be more in line with the rest of Canada to, to a minimum of 945 hours. We also understand that uh, you will be traveling to Inuvik and Hay River this week. Although, uh, although travel to these uh, regional centers is important, it's unfortunate that our teachers in these communities will be on spring break and uh, that may impact the number of uh, uh, presentations from teachers that you may hear during these times. Uh, the NWTTA, uh, like many concerned parties in the Northwest Territories, was happy to hear about the additional funding for junior kindergarten that was recently announced. Uh, we have stated from the beginning that we support the idea of junior kindergarten as long as it is funded. There is a reality here in the Northwest Territories that many of our young students start school with a significant delay, uh, development delays. NWT schools can offer universal support for all four-year-olds across the North. Every community in the Northwest Territories has access to a school. Schools have the infrastructure already in place to support the needs of these students by trained professionals who are able to assess, evaluate, and support the needs of these students. The NWTDA supports changes to reduce the minimum instructional hours down to 945 hours, not only to help reduce teacher workload, which we know sits at around an, of an average of around 40, 52 uh, hours per week, but also to improve the learning environment of the schools by providing time for teachers to meet and collaboratively plan together. This will lead to improvements in student achievement. To date, because of the STEP MOU, most teachers have had an opportunity to have one or two days without students to work on report cards. The amount of time needed to complete report cards varies by grade and school, but up to now the majority of this work has been done on evenings or on weekends. Many teachers have commented to the NWTTA, to their superintendents and to their parents that uh, the value of being able to complete report cards on this day. More than one teacher has stated that this is the, uh, been, has been the most positive change to their working conditions they've ever experienced. And here are some of the comments that some teachers have shared with us. It has allowed me time to complete report cards during the school day, which took a lot of stress away from me as I was able to spend time with my family on the weekend. It, it has given teachers more time to connect with each other regarding student learning and supporting students. It has allowed for cooperation in order to strengthen concepts and strategies uh, used uh, in subjects and grades. And it has allowed teachers to support one another. It is also worth mentioning that the proposals for STIP that have been proposed to our committee all have, all have kept these um, STIP days for teachers to complete report cards. There's been a lot of debate over the merits of strengthening, to teach, uh, strengthening teachers' instructional practice, MOU, or STIP. These changes are not giving teachers time away from the school, but allowing them time to meet at school and to plan with other teachers, as well as receive in-service to strengthen their teaching practices. Here are some examples of what schools and instructional practice are planning for next year. So I've taken these right from their STIP proposals that they were, that these have been accepted by the committee, and, I, and I'll just read some of these. Uh, the STIP plan will give teachers time to complete tasks such as report cards, uh, IEPs, SSPs, and to build on current professional learning committee uh, pr uh, pr process by allowing more opportunities for student collabor sorry for teacher collaboration and and response to intervention. Most importantly, our STIP time will be set as a framework for our instructional coach to work with teachers one-on-one -on -one to help strengthen instructional practice within the school, which in turn benefits students. Another school. Um, by implementing the STIP pilot in our school, teachers will better be able to collaborate in their professional learning communities, create and plan new forms of assessment and look at how data should drive our practice as teachers. This will give teachers the opportunity to support one another as well as the students and lead them to improving student benchmark levels by a minimum of two grade equivalents. 
all proposed plans take into consideration what is best for students before the final plan is formalized this demonstrates the dedication and consideration to best practices that n w t teachers have when planning for their students and i'd like to turn it over to mr mel chair thank you mr over mr thank you mr thank you mr chair um with uh, <clears throat> the status quo is not an option uh, and this is a difficult notion to speak to in light that we all have to admit that the present system is not working well enough for our students, our communities, or our teachers. Our students are as capable as students from anywhere else in the world. But we all know that they are not achieving the results that we know they can. The system has to change. We have to make the changes that will have an impact on learning and improving the system. Student instructional time has a very low correlation to improving learning. The most important correlation to improving student outcomes is having a knowledgeable, knowledgeable and skillful teacher. Many studies show that education resources that focus on the skill of the educators provides the best improvement to student achievement. We need to give teachers the time and the training to further develop their skills as educators. One of the highest correlations to improving teacher instructional practice is to have time to work collaboratively with each other. One of the objectives of reducing instructional time is to allow for some job embedded collaborative practice. As demonstrated by research, we need to make improvements in our system that will have the biggest potential for improving our schools. One of the things that we need to find is time to make the improvements. And the reduction of instructional time or redirected instructional time is one way to do that. At this time, I'd also like to note that we're not looking to reduce the work day. We are hoping the redirected instructional time from what is already the longest instructional day in Canada to allow time for the other work that teachers are required to do. If we continue to do what we're doing, we will continue, continue to keep getting the same results. Improving the working conditions of our teachers will have a positive impact on student success. There is significant teacher turnover in northern NWT schools. This is expensive financially, and takes a great deal of administrative time as it takes work to develop young teachers. Principals are often working in isolation and in many small schools also see significant turnover. We want the best teachers in the country working in our schools and it takes time and resources to develop teachers. Some of that development is done by the self-directed professional development that teachers do, but there also has to be time in the school day to develop their craft. If we continually ask that our teachers work in conditions that are not optimal, they will continue to leave. While STIP alone will not solve all of the changes that are needed in education, it is a step in the right direction. We, we know that we will see positive change to student achievement if we allow st teachers the time to work collaboratively. We also would want to acknowledge there are other things that are important to improving schools. Low attendance rates, teacher retention, uh, housing concerns in communities, the impact of residential schools, and many other things affect the, the effectiveness of our schools. I will once again ask, the, end of, the NWTTA encourages you to support the changes to Bill 16. And I'll make closing comments to Mr. Oliver. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Oliver. Um, as you know, Adrian Amaro and I are here representing the 800 teachers. And so you can say we've got our association of union hats on. But, but Adrian and I have been teaching combined for 61 years. And so we're, we're really been teachers for most of our lives. And so we're also here as teachers. And uh, with, for teaching for 61 years, we have a love for education and a desire for kids to succeed. It, it, we have our, our, our track record here in the Northwest Territories is there. Um, that's why teachers work 52 hours a week. There's that passion that we want something good for our students. And often many teachers put their own students ahead of their families when it comes to their time. Um, we too want to make sure that good things are happening to our kids. And we believe that the changes proposed in Bill 16 will, will move in the right direction. And if we didn't believe that uh, Bill 16 would have positive changes in education, we wouldn't be sitting here proposing and supporting that. In fact, we would be here speaking against it. 
but we believe that the changes in Bill 16 will have a positive impact on students in the Northwest Territories. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any comments or questions for the two presenters? I don't see any. I thank you both for coming. Oh, Mr. Riley. <laughs> uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. So. Um, uh, I know that the two of you sit on the uh, um, joint committee uh, that's uh, reviewing the uh, proposals for uh, 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 changes in instructional hours, um, and, and you're also presumably going to be involved in the development of the, the evaluation uh, framework. So um, just can you just describe for me uh, the work of the committee so far, Are things going well? How, how it might be improved or whatever, and then whether you've been able to do, uh, I imagine most of your time's been uh, spent on the uh, uh, reviewing the proposals rather than getting to the evaluation framework, but when, uh, so if you could just describe when you might be able to get to the evaluation framework and if you have any sort of preliminary ideas around uh, what that might start to look like, that would, that would be helpful for me to understand that. Thanks, okay. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Mr. Oliver. I think one of the words that uh, Dave Roebuck, our previous uh, executive director, has spoken was uh, he said this is the biggest initiative the NWTTA has ever been part of in his 18 years with us. So it is a big initiative. I look at my report coming up to AMCC. We, I, without it's quick, there's about 30 days that we've met on this with the CNE superintendents and that. So it is a uh, Mr. Riley. It's, it is a, a big initiative for us. Uh, a lot of that time was uh, just getting together the proposal to share out with superintendents and schools. And most recently, you're right, in the last uh, two or three weeks, we've uh, been receiving proposals and uh, accepting them and asking them, sending some back to fine tune. Like, we don't quite see where your redirected hours are going. Uh, does this include this um, non-instructional hours in those proposals and they've been being sent back to superintendents and principals for more information on that. Um, we've had one meeting on uh, presently to uh, look at uh, the evaluation process, but once I would say by the end of April uh, or towards the end of April, that's when the, the lion's share of our meetings will probably go. And, uh, and, and hopefully, uh, I believe the plan is in place to have an uh, evaluation process in place um, towards the end of the school year. Okay, seeing no any other questions, I'd thank, would like thank to thank you. you for both for coming and presenting to the committee. Uh, you're more than welcome to stay and listen to the rest of the presentations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stephanie Earl Er. Fox. Your name wrong. Okay. Proceed. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Um, I am grateful to the four MLAs who are at this committee today. Um, I have to say, seeing the entire senior management team of the Department of Education get up and leave before other people were here to give their views on this fairly significant policy initiative makes it feel like this might be a little bit of window dressing. The department officials, the minister talked about how they wanted to hear from the public and that they're engaging with people. And to get up and leave before people gave their views makes that look a little less than truthful or sincere. Um, I'll start by introducing myself. I'm a product of the Northern Education System. I attended elementary school and high school in Inuvik. I didn't go to school in Yellowknife. So I identify quite strongly with children, with students outside of Yellowknife who are going to be the ones bearing the implications of this proposal. I then went on to get a bachelor's and a master's degree at the University of Alberta, and then I received a full scholarship to Cambridge University in England, one of the best universities on the planet. So while I'm not here representing an organization, I do think I embody the full potential of the education system here and what people can achieve if they have a very solid foundation 
in kindergarten to grade 12. I should say that I am also an adjunct professor at Carleton University in the School of Public Policy. I'm also an adjunct professor at the Faculty of Native Studies at the University of Alberta. I have my own business and I've spent the past 20 years advising, being a researcher for indigenous governments across the Northwest Territories, mainly on land claim and self-government agreements. So when I think about the implications of these changes for the education system, I'm not so worried about kids in Yellowknife, children like my own, for example, who have two well-educated parents and go to schools that are extremely well-resourced. I think about the kids in small communities, such as in Mr. Blake's constituency or Mr. Natalie's constituency. I think about the kids whose parents themselves didn't get a great education and who are suffering the impacts of colonization and residential school. And I really wonder what the Department of Education could possibly be thinking, putting this bill before our MLAs to consider passing. I have six issues that I've set out. You should all have received electronically my submission, and I hope that you all have the chance to read it. The first issue, and this is the title of my presentation, is I would like NWT MLAs to maintain the integrity of the Alberta curriculum all I would like MLAs to do is to ensure that if the Alberta curriculum requires 952 or 1,000 hours or 500 hours, that we abide by that. Don't change it. Don't make it any less. The Department of Education has changed their communications over the last several months. They started out by saying, we teach the most hours of everyone and anyone in Canada. Our teachers work a lot more than anyone else. In New Brunswick, they do this. In BC, they do that. We are focused on Alberta. That's the curriculum that we teach here. And so the minimum hours prescribed by Alberta until they are changed is what our students deserve. If they don't get those instructional hours, our students are being shortchanged. They are not getting the hours that Alberta students are getting. Therefore, they won't be getting the same diploma. I know the department has all kinds of fancy arguments and fancy research and all sorts of confusing things that they're trying to use to convince people otherwise. But until Alberta changes their requirements, please don't do this to our children. The second thing which Mr. Simpson identified, and I really don't think that enough has been made of this, is that the Department of Education signed a union agreement where they promised that they would make proposals for legislative change. I have been sitting at negotiating tables working for Indigenous organizations for the last 20 years, and the one thing that government hammers into us all the time is they cannot possibly promise that Parliament will pass a law or even come up with the money to fund these agreements because there's this thing called the prerogative of parliament. Bureaucrats cannot promise that you, legislatures, will pass a law. They cannot do that. And certainly in the MOU, they haven't done that. If you look at the technical wording, they don't say that you will. But they have put you in a really difficult political position. And the Department of Education, which I was shocked to hear, just told you that if you don't pass this legislation, the teachers get the shaft. The teachers will have to suck it up. I couldn't believe what I was hearing from the minister and I was a little disappointed that that was not questioned a little bit more by MLAs. So we have a situation where this entire process is tainted. They have signed an agreement with the NWTTA where they have said to the teachers, don't worry, we'll get the legislation passed to get this 100 hours of instructional time cut. And now they're coming to you and saying, if you don't pass this, you're going to take a big political hit. I sincerely hope that this committee, at least, if not MLAs, will take aside, if not the minister, then whoever was on the bargaining team, or perhaps the deputy minister, and instruct them on what their job is. 
Or perhaps next time put a political advisor on the negotiating committee so that they don't do this to you again. This to me is beyond the pale that the Department of Education would try to pull a fast one and hope that you and that the public wouldn't notice. This does not help build their case about being open and sincere and engaging with the public. And I also want to say right now, I fully support the teachers' right to bargain. And I think that the agreement that this government has made with the teachers absolutely should be honored. I don't think the teachers should get the shaft. I think that if you don't pass this legislation, that the teachers should still get a 100-hour reduction in the workload that they have, not the instructional hours they have to teach, but more on that later. The teachers, when they voted on this agreement, I'm sure would have had their legal counsel advising them that the Department of Education can't promise what the MLAs were, would do. So if the NWTTA or if the Department of Education did not fully inform their teachers that they could not bind a legislature, I think that's a significant problem. And the teachers may have been on voting something that they weren't fully informed about. But I'm merely a member of the public. When I asked to see the union agreement, when I asked for any information about it, I was told that I couldn't have it. And indeed, it is a deal between the teachers and the government, and that's their business, and I respect that. I guess this whole thing makes me wonder, what's the problem we're trying to solve here? And this leads to issue four in my presentation and the written materials that I've provided you. ECE and the minister has gone before this committee, and the minister has spoken in the House, and they are convincing us that teachers work 50, 55 hours now I'm hearing, 52 hours I've heard. Anyway, teachers are working, every single one of them is working an additional 10 to 15 hours a week. So that means we know we have a workforce, a group of, of people who are all being required to work 10 to 15 hours of overtime a week. I guess to a regular person, perhaps because I'm not working in ECE, in some specialized position, to me, that says we don't have enough teachers. That is our problem. We need more teachers to share this workload. That's the issue that we're trying to solve. So if the issue that we're trying to solve is that teachers are working too much and that we need more of them, why can't we hire more of them? I've spent a lot of my own personal time on this issue. I've done research. I have met with Rita Muller. I have talked to a lot of parents on this issue. When I was in Inuvik, I talked to a number of people a couple of weeks ago who'd heard me on the radio and had the same concerns that I had. Reducing instructional hours is a de facto budget cut. You have all of these teachers, 700, 800 of them, all working overtime every day, every week. Instead of offering them a raise in salary, because they know that, instead of saying, well, maybe we'll hire more admin staff, maybe we'll hire other support staff for teachers, the best the ECE can come up with is let's cut instructional hours. There have been no other alternatives, to my knowledge, put before the public, put before MLAs, or possible through this legislation. Instead, they've come up with what they're calling STIP, Strengthening Teacher Instructional Practice, and they're conflating it with reducing instructional hours, which means that they're saying, if we want to give our teachers professional development, take from our students, stop teaching our students in order to teach our teachers who have university degrees. If we're going to do that, we have to cut the instructional hours of students. We have to not teach the people who don't have an education to teach the people who have one. This doesn't make any sense. I think it would be reasonable if there are seven or 800 people working overtime constantly that the department look at alternative options to lightening that workload. This is a budget cut. It may not be a decrease in funds, but the paycheck for our students is a good Alberta diploma. 
what we're now going to be providing is some version of an Alberta diploma, a substandard version probably of an Alberta diploma. The paycheck for students at the end of the day is going to be a lot less. This diploma will be worth a lot less than when I went to school in Inuvik in the 1980s. So what's the implications of this? The education system, a well-educated population, is the foundation of a healthy economy, of a healthy society. It is basically the foundation of our future and future generations. What's going to happen when our students who, after 12 years of getting 50 to 100 hours less, I'm not quite sure because the department itself isn't quite sure, as you just heard, of how many hours will be cut or what will be cut or when it will be cut. Essentially, over the course of 12 years, we are shaving off an entire year of instruction time from the Alberta Diploma. So if you're a student in Edmonton, you get all of that instruction time. If you're a student from Yellowknife or Fort McPherson or Fort Resolution or Fort Simpson, you're actually going to get 11 years of instruction. You'll have a full year less. But you have to compete against all those other kids who all got the instructional time. So when you go to university, when you go to trade school, when you go to college, if you want to go into the workforce, you won't have the same Alberta grade 12 diploma. That is simply a fact based on what we know now. As someone who has spent a lot of time in communities working on negotiating self-government agreements and land claim agreements, people ask negotiating teams all the time, what makes self-government work? What makes land claims work? It's not really the agreement you get, it's whether your people are educated. So if this government would like to gut the potential of land claims and self-government, if this government would like to gut the potential and disadvantage Indigenous students in the Northwest Territories who already have so much stacked against them to begin with, let's run with this. Let's give them a grade 12 diploma that gives them a year less instruction of what students in Alberta are getting. This is a really good plan for disadvantaging our future generations, our children today, and for creating problems in the future. And I guess that's a question I would have for the MLAs from outside of Yellowknife, but also the MLAs, I guess, in Yellowknife as well. How do you think this is going to affect the children in your regions? How do you think this is going to enhance their life chances? They're already struggling with so much. Why would we do this to them? So I have a recommendation for this committee. I think you should honor the agreement that was made with the teachers. I think their workloads should be reduced. I think they should be working a 40-hour work week or whatever it is that is standard um, for teachers to work. But instead of, instruct instead of cutting instructional hours, I think their workload in other areas should be cut. And at some point, if Alberta revises their curriculum and says, you know what, we only need 900 hours, we only need 950 hours, then our legislation should be changed. But until that point, what I would like from MLAs is that I want you to know you are the last safeguard of this very fundamental expectation of parents and of students. We're relying on you to make sure that if we're developing, if we're delivering, sorry, an Alberta curriculum, that our students get the same instructional hours that other students are getting in Alberta. That they get the same kind of diploma the kids in Alberta are getting and that they get the advantage of having face time with teachers, of spending time in classrooms, of being with their peers in a positive, constructive environment. So I don't agree with the Department of Education. I don't agree that it should be put on you if you don't pass this legislation. I think it should be put on the Department of Education. And the only way they would be able to honor this agreement if you don't pass this legislation is if they hire more teachers. And fundamentally, 
No matter what they say, no matter what arguments or research they wave in our faces, this comes back to this proposal comes from a union negotiation agreement. This doesn't come from their renewal initiative. Nowhere in that document does it talk about cutting instructional hours. It talks about professional development for teachers. It doesn't talk about this. So when Mr. Simpson asked the minister today, doesn't this come from, or I'm, I'm not sure if maybe it was Mr. O'Reilly, where does this come from? It comes from the union agreement, nowhere else. So I hope that what I've had to say today um, is useful. I'd like you to know that it's heartfelt. I'd also like you to know that it is no fun coming forward as an individual in a place as small as Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories and criticizing these kinds of agreements and putting forth these kinds of views. But nobody else is able to do it because they've signed confidentiality agreements with their employer, the GNWT, or for other reasons, they don't feel that they can go public with this. So I thank you for your time, and if anyone has any questions, I'm certainly willing to take them. Any questions? Mr. O'Reilly. <laughs> uh, thanks. Uh, no, I, well, I'd, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Earl Bacher Fox for coming forward. I think you've uh, um, brought forward some um, different views, and I think it's very important that they get uh, aired uh, uh, as part of the review of this uh, bill. Um, um, I would, if you haven't had a chance to review uh, the news release that went out yesterday with the correspondence between the, the committee and the minister, I would suggest you do have a look at it because I think it does address some of the issues that you've raised, um, uh, particularly around the uh, uh, negotiating mandate. Uh, that was uh, um, given to the negotiators, and we weren't part of that. And we've asked for information, and we haven't been that we've been told is cabinet confidence, so we're not privy to it. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure what else I can say, but uh, I, I think I can say that uh, as a regular MLA, I do not appreciate the position that the department has put us in. I think it's a very difficult one. At the same time, I do appreciate uh, what the, the teachers have said about their workload and having uh, kids that have gone through the system here in Yellowknife, I, I, I acknowledge, uh, I, I certainly appreciate all the work that the teachers do uh, for our students. So, sorry, it's more of a comment than anything else, but I do appreciate her, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Ms. Errol Bacher fox coming forward with her views. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Mr. Blake. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, you know, from small communities, we see firsthand, you know, what challenges we have in the communities, and, you know, everything that you outlined is what is happening and challenges that our students face in the small communities. And, you know, I share a lot of the same same uh, concerns as you do, and that's why we're here is to take all these concerns from the public uh, on this, on this, um, initiative here, but uh, I'd really like to thank you and, uh, you know, um, of course we won't make our decision until till, uh, the spring here, but uh, thank you once again. I'll see. Thank you, Mr. Blake. Any other comments? No? Um, on behalf of the committee, I greatly appreciate for taking your time. I totally understand being the voice for people sometimes is difficult, but it's actually true leadership and I thank that. Thank you for that. Um, I too am like you. I've been born and raised in this beautiful country. Uh, this is my home. I, not here, but in Hay River. And I live in Fort Simpson. So when I'm very fortunate. My children have graduated through our education system. So uh, the teachers have done a great job. Um, and But again, we're trying to hear the information. We have limited abilities. We have to be honest with you with that. Um, but we're hearing the concerns from everybody and uh, as Mr. Riley said if you have the opportunity to look at our correspondence um, we're trying to share as much information out there as possible with what we're trying to do um, and again I thank you very much uh, it was well thought out and I could feel the passion in your in your presentation because uh, I didn't see you look at your notes very much it was very well presented so thank you very much 
in closing comments on your part? Or? Um, yeah, you know, and I, I just want to reiterate that I absolutely support the teachers, and I absolutely think that any agreement made with them should be honored um, if it's within the power of the committee to do so. And my only, I guess, concern is that it should be honored in a way that does not disadvantage the children of the Northwest Territories. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Fox, I appreciate your time. Um, at this point in time, Mr. Jim Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Thank you very much. Uh, can you state who you are and what you're, who you're present, representing? And um, I'm representing uh, parents and students. Okay. I'm probably the only person here who's not paid to be here today. Um, I do appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak to the uh, remaining members of the Standing Committee who are here this afternoon. Um, in brief, and I will refer to my, I must say, first of all, uh, that I agree with everything that uh, Stephanie Earl Barker Fox said this afternoon. Um, she said it uh, much more eloquently than I could ever do so. Um, and uh, one point that I would like to bring up from this morning, I, it's an unfortunate that the education officials are not here at this time, but um, uh, for the MLA that asked the question about the accountability framework, I wouldn't put too much uh, faith in that. They've been working on it for over 20 years. Um, in brief, uh, my submission is not in opposition to the proposed reduction in instructional hours to 945 hours for the elementary grades, subject to one proviso. Rather, I would like to add to the conversation with respect to a clarification of terms and to give a little background and context regarding number of hours of instruction in the Northwest Territories. The information which I will present, I expect to take uh, 13 minutes. A little uh, background first. I'm an independent education consultant in the Northwest Territories, but previous to this, I was an elementary school teacher, I was a high school teacher, I was a, high, uh, a principal in three separate schools in the Northwest Territories, and I was the superintendent of schools for eight years in the Northwest Territories. As an aside, the current Minister of Education used to be one of my students. The Department of Education recognized several decades ago, and by the way, this is my 40th year in education in the Northwest Territories. The Northwest Territories Department of Education recognized several decades ago that the number of hours of instruction in the NWT exceeded that of most of the provinces and territories in, in Canada. To mitigate the impact of the teaching load the Department of Education, together with the NWT Teachers Association, worked to redefine and reallocate 45 hours of instructional time to non-instructional time. And I'm really disappointed that this has not been brought forward by any education officials. So because the hours were the greatest in the land, the number of hours of instruction, probably 25 to 30 years ago, and I do have a copy from um, a then Assistant Deputy Minister Dan Daniels, which will explain it. Uh, I'm not presenting anything here this afternoon that I don't have evidence for. Um, that the Department of Education agreed to take off 45 hours of instruction and call them non-instructional hours. And they did this for all grades, from grades 1 to 12. However, those non-instructional hours are included in the instructional hour count. And should this committee, should this standing committee, should the Legislative Assembly reduce the number of hours of instruction, they would be reducing them from an, uh, an allocation that's already 45, uh, 45 hours less than what's stated in the legislation. 
the Northwest Territories Teachers Association agrees with my math. And I have it in writing from them as well, saying that the new instructional hours would in fact be 900 hours per year. I have this as an add-in to my submission. Not 945 hours, because you have to recognize that 45 hours of instruction is non-instructional. This is time teachers use for clubs, for parent-teacher interviews, extracurricular activities. I'm really disappointed that that didn't come out. In other words, there's a distinction between hours of instruction and student contact time. And that distinction has not been, been made. If this bill is passed in its present form, the de facto NWT hours of instruction for elementary schools students will be 50 hours less, about nine days, than the province of Alberta, which is 950 hours. And for senior high, it would be 100 hours less than, or 145 hours if you include the non-instructional hours. I cannot understand why the information and the inclusion of 45 hours of non-instructional time embedded in the instructional time has not been shared with parents. I know, because I worked in the education system. Surely this is pertinent information. As an aside, I checked the ECE website under ECE values. The website states, to enhance our credibility to the public we serve, we will be open, honest, sincere, and respectful. I'll leave it to the standing committee to determine if neglecting to inform parents about the true hours of instruction is being open and honest. One of the activities I perform for school boards is management reviews. I know from experience that many, many teachers at the grade one to nine levels have great difficulty teaching the entire school curriculum each year. There is often simply not enough time. For example, in mathematics, probability and statistics is taught as part of the math curriculum. But if it is taught at all, it is most often taught at the end of the school year because in most math texts, that's where it appears. Now, teachers aren't supposed to teach to the text. They're supposed to teach to the, to the curriculum. I know that from conducting an item analysis of math tests that many students in the NWT perform poorly in probability and statistics, not because our students are less capable, but because they've never been taught it. I fail to see how shortening the number of hours of instruction to 50 hours less than, was, than what is taught in Alberta is going to rectify the situation. By the way, the Department of Education does not keep statistics on whether or not teachers teach the entire curriculum in any given year. They don't collect data, and they never have. Don't you think it would be important to have this data to determine if teachers have adequate time right now to complete the curriculum in every subject area before reducing instructional hours? I'm disappointed because I expect more from professionals. I'm disappointed because the setting of the hours of instruction should be based on sound pedagogy. I'm disappointed because the setting of the hours of instruction should be based on empirical evidence and the scientific method, not on hope. I'm disappointed because the hours of instruction were set at the bargaining table in the absence of a representative selected by and from the School Superintendents Association of the NWT. I'm disappointed because members of the Standing Committee have said that have given their support to this bill before hearing from members of the public who elected them. I'm disappointed that district education authorities and divisional education councils who speak for parents were presented with this reduction in instructional hours 
as a fait accompli. I'm disappointed because I saw a notice in our northern newspapers posted by the Legislative Assembly that stated in bold letters, your opinion matters. Does it really? And with all due respect to the members of the Standing Committee, when did our legislators change the mandate of our government to allow negotiating to change legislation at the bargaining table? I mean, isn't that your job? Call me jaded, but hasn't an agreement with the Teachers Association already been signed? Hasn't an additional three days less instruction and time off for students already been taken this school year? How can my opinion possibly matter? And finally, I am disappointed with the lack of transparency and what the Department of Education, Culture and Employment did not, and that the Department of ECE did not operationally define their terms. Who in this room could know the number of instructional hours actually includes non-instructional hours? My sense as to what would be appropriate would be for the NWT to match the instructional time to that of Alberta. After all, at least for senior high, we use the Alberta curriculum. This would result in a minimum instructional time of 950 hours for elementary and junior high and 1,000 hours of instruction for senior high. And of course, the instructional time would be authentic instructional time and not be reduced by out of classroom and extracurricular activities as is currently the case. All decisions concerning the education of our children should be made to increase the likelihood of student success. All decisions should be made with the students in mind. With all the challenges in our schools and the more than $30,000 per cost per student per year, is a reduction in classroom hours the best that we can do? And finally, one question I would pose to the Standing Committee is to ask officials at ECE, why do ECE officials believe that NWT students can successfully complete grade 10, 11, 12 uh, Alberta curriculum in fewer, fewer hours than Alberta students? I think that's a valid question. In summation, although I'm certainly not a lawyer, I believe that legislation trumps any MOU or agreement that was signed with the Teachers Association and that this government has already broken the law this current school year by reducing the instructional hours by an additional three days of instruction, resulting in the minimum hours not being met this current school year without legislative approval. If this is what education renewal looks like, um, I'm not certain there'll be very many parents on board. And, you know, I agree with a lot of the information that was presented, uh, especially by the NWTTA, but they don't speak for parents and they don't speak for students. They speak for teachers. They speak for the teacher welfare. Who's left to speak for the parents and students? So many people uh, work for the government. Um, they can't speak what's on their mind. And, um, you know, I do appreciate that there is a public hearing here, even though there is no education officials, um, you know, to hear from the public. Uh, I think this is a very, very important part. And I think that this standing committee needs to question ECE officials um, do the hours that they present here, are those with the 45 hours of non-instructional time already included? Because somehow this has been omitted from the, uh, from the debate. Thank you. Any comments or questions for Mr. Anderson? Mr. Riley. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Anderson, you indicated you had some additional materials. You'd, can you please... Uh, make sure that they go to our committee clerk so that we have that uh, on the record for our consideration. That would be much appreciated. Thank you. I, I certainly will. And Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Oh, Mr. Chair? Yes, go ahead, Mr. Anderson. I, I, I certainly will. 
And I would like to read the one that is from the Teachers Association that I noticed that they didn't bring up here today. Hi, James. I have, a I have clarification from Adrian on the instructional hours. The new minimum 945 hours will be inclusive of the 45 hours of non-instructional contact time. So actual minimum instructional hours will be 900 hours. This is not to say all schools and grade levels will be the same. And as I said yesterday, some schools are above the existing uh, 1,045 or 997 hours or below. So that's why the, the wording of the MOU is redirecting up to 100 hours of instructional time. Each school will have to review their instructional hours and adjust their schedules accordingly to fit the pilot. Hope this helps. Regards, Dave Robach, Labor Relations Advisor, NWT Teachers Association. So the Teachers Association already knows that the real hours are 900, not 945 as specified by our department. And yes, I'm happy to leave all that information with you. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, Mr. No, thanks. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Um, before you go, I thank you very much, Mr. Anderson, for coming and providing your knowledge and your experience. It, it helps, uh, especially since you've been in the system and given us this information. Just to clarify, this is our committee opening it up and, and listening to you. So the department does have somebody here taking notes. Um, Terrific. Um, so they're do, they are hearing the information and the, the committee will also be sharing that information with the minister and the department. Um, the, the, again, uh, it's, I guess I can, that's all I can say in that matter. And so I, again, thank you very much. And as Mr. Riley said, if you're willing to share with that information with you, if you want to keep it and we can photocopy it for you, yep. um, we can do all that. And so we can add that to our part of our hearing process. I brought along extra copies. Okay, thank you, Mr. Anderson. Oz Shoe. Oz Shoe. Yeah, we'll get there. By the end of this term, I'll have your name down, Pat. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Mr. Post. I can present to who you're representing and, and from that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, today, I'm actually before you wearing, wearing two hats. Um, I have a, a brief couple of comments about the instructional hours and, and some comments about the, the age change for, to allow for junior kindergarten. Um, and to that I'll be speaking as the, the chair of the NWT Montessori Society. Um, but instructional hours is just me as a, as a parent, an individual. Um, j just in brief, I know there's been a lot of comments today about the instructional hours and that part of the bill. Um, and you know, it's, it's an interesting discussion and in trying to understand how many hours teachers are in classrooms and it's uh, important that there's enough time that they have to do their own work and, and provide a good environment for our, for our students. But one thing that uh, I, I do have challenge with is that it's, it's a pilot program as it's been discussed and yet the change in legislation is permanent. Um, the, the amendments to the bill don't say for the next three hours the, the, hours, of, the hours of instruction will be 945 hours and then it will revert back to what it is currently. Um, it doesn't take them out of the legislation and put it into regulation to be set by the minister or cabinet, which I would also sort of understand. There'd be some flexibility there. Um, but if it's a three-year pilot and it's a, a permanent change to legislation, um, it just seems a bit odd to me um, that to go back, if the pilot doesn't work, we then have to have another legislative amendment in the future. Um, to bring the hours of, of practice back, uh, which to me implies that it's more of a permanent change. And if so, then it's not a pilot program. It's a permanent program change, and that's fine. But let's call it that, and then have a discussion about the, the validity of the program as something uh, permanently changed. Um, I think it'd be fairly simple to add to the legislation a, a clause that says this is the way the legislation is set up. This is the number of hours for the next three years, and then in uh, 20. 2020, uh, the hours will go back to what they are currently. Um, but uh, suffice it to say, there's been lots of other words about the instructional hours uh, spoken today, so I will, I will leave that. Um, as the chair of the NWT Montessori Society, I know I've before, appeared before you a number of times to talk about junior kindergarten um, and, and the approach to junior kindergarten taken in the NWT. Um, a concern with the legislation um, is that right now, 
we're expanding junior kindergarten to every community in the NWT as of September. Um, but there's still a number of concerns. Uh, there's been a number of concerns expressed by committee, by the public. Uh, in the last session, uh, at the end of the session, um, a petition was tabled uh, about making options for junior kindergarten and for people who choose something else to make sure those options are free. Um, there have been a number of uh, concerns expressed all across the NWT, but uh, before we address those, we're simply putting it into legislation that this will happen. Um, I'd like to ask MLAs to take pause on this and say, well, maybe we shouldn't be passing legislation to expand the program to the entire territory until all of these concerns have been addressed. Um, right now, it seems that there's a, an attitude of, well, it's just going to happen. Um, but I, I'd, I'd urge people to take a look at that bill and say, well, maybe it shouldn't happen until we make sure the actual program is set up properly. Uh, in one respect, one very important respect, is that junior kindergarten has been uh, set to be funded at a 12 to 1 uh, funding ratio. Um, that's not a class size limit, that's not anything else, but it's a funding ratio. Uh, currently, the funding ratio is defined in Section 128 of the legislation, and as of 2004, it was changed to a 16 to 1 funding ratio. Um, that's an important number, but I don't understand how if we're going to move forward with the junior kindergarten program with a different funding ratio that's been guaranteed at 12 to 1, why that's not being included in the legislation as well. Um, if it's something that we're guaranteeing and the department has said this is how we're going to carry on with this program, it's, I think it's also very important that we make sure that funding is included in, in legislation. Um, often we, we hear about uh, departments being funded, uh, school boards being funded actually at better than a, a 16 to 1 ratio, which is great, so perhaps the, the 16 to 1 should also be adjusted to whatever the reality of funding is, but it, it's important if we're going to have a special funding class that that be included, since otherwise, um, the department would certainly be uh, in the right in following along with legislation to in future years increase that funding or, or decrease the funding to a ratio of 13 to 1 or 14 or all the way up to 16 to 1. Um, again, it's, it's a simple extra clause in, the, in, in this bill that's not included there and I think its omission is a, a pretty significant piece going forward. Um, but, but mostly uh, the importance is if we're going to expand this program to the entire territory at this point in time, um, it doesn't make sense with, with the level of, of opposition and questions and changes that are required in the program. Uh, an implementation plan has not been tabled. Um, how it's going to be rolled out is still being determined and still being sorted out. And if that's the case, then, then why are MLAs uh, passing a bill that says this program can be expanded and, and, and must be then available everywhere? Those are things that should be answered first. Um, so I can leave it at that, um, but I would... Uh, just ask that uh, MLAs take the responsibility as legislators to take a look at the legislation and the programs that it enables as it's passing and not simply take uh, the bills simply as, as tabled in the House already and acknowledge that changes can and, and perhaps should be made. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Any questions or comments? No? Well, I thank you very much for coming and presenting to the committee. Uh, and if you have any other notes that you wish to share with us, um, please give them to our clerk, or you can send still an email, written submissions as well. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, we'll, we'll forward a, a written submission as well uh, in the coming days. Okay. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Okay. Um, so is there any other presenters? Uh, I guess not. At that point in time, I'd like to thank everybody that came out and presented uh, and came to this public hearing. Uh, it was greatly appreciated. As we move forward, like we said, we'll be in a new Vic in A River uh, to hear from the public as well. So uh, thank you very much, and we'll call the meeting and adjourn it. Thank you.